Right, today's Thursday. <laughs> Only one more to go after today. That's it. Uh, uh, one thing I, I wanted to mention, uh, well, two things, just additional things. Um, um, Buffet asked me the other day whether European philosophy included England, English philosophy. And uh, the, the name that used to be used for European philosophy, just to clear this up, was continental philosophy, which makes it quite clear that it doesn't include England. Um, and English philosophy is now really comes under the heading of what's often called Anglo-American philosophy, uh, which is uh, analytical, based very much on logic and, and so on and that. It's an analytical kind of philosophy. A continental philosophy is not analytical, but of course it's very confusing. <coughs> there are philosophers in continental Europe who follow the analytical approach. And in America, well, in America particularly, there are a lot, a lot of philosophers who follow the phenomenological hermeneutic continental approach. So these, there is no, um, there is a, uh, no labelling system that will ever makes it clear. Uh, you, for example, who, who, who was Wittgenstein? Well, Wittgenstein is looked upon as one of the founders of modern, modern analytical philosophy. Wittgenstein was actually European, he was Viennese. From his passport, it's quite clear that he spent more time in Vienna every year than he did in Cambridge. Because Cambridge had terms that were only eight weeks long. The three eights are 24. He would leave Cambridge the day after the end of term and return to Cambridge the day before the end of term. Consequently, he spent more time out of England than he did, but he's down as a British philosopher. Uh, he was, of course, came from a very, very famous family in Vienna, and his whole culture and life was actually Viennese. Um, and uh, he used to say, you English, you're so stupid, you don't understand what I was saying. And I said, oh, yes. But actually, it turned out later, they said that Wittgenstein meant it. They completely, they completely misunderstood what he was saying. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Um, so it, 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 he's, now it's realised that a lot of what he did was really very close to phenomenology and he was well aware of what was going on in continental Europe. So the, none of these things, none of these systems work. But basically, when I talk about European philosophy, it doesn't include what would be called English language philosophy, which is a different kind of thing altogether. So perhaps the old name, continental, was better, but it also has a bit twee now, continental, doesn't it? Have you gone to the continent? <laughs> this is a bit twee. Of course, that, there's that lovely, um, there's that lovely uh, newspaper heading up. The newspaper stands in London would have the placards outside what the headlines were that day, you know. Uh, they don't have newspaper stands now, what they do, but they don't. Think. And this day it said, um, fog in channel, continent cut off. <laughs> it's, ne it's never England cut off this small time. It's always continent cut off. And that's how we think, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so there we are. Anyway, there we go. That's enough of that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Now, uh, the second thing is uh, this book belonged to Stefan's father. It's a very interesting book on the writings of Goethe, which he kindly lent me. And the introduction by Stephen Spender reminded me of something that I really did want to uh, bring out. Um, right at the very beginning, I said, well, this dynamic way of thinking occurs in the 20th century, but it's there, previous century, the, eight, the 19th century where it comes in with the philosophy of German idealism and the Romantic movement. And Goethe is always associated with the Romantic movement. And in many, many, many cases, you can read in books that Goethe was, they call, the, the father of, the, of Romanticism. So it's very interesting to find that he himself uh, very, very firmly rejected Romanticism as a form of sickness. Um, uh, he was, when he was a young man, part of this movement which became known as Sturm und Drang. Does that mean storm and stress? 
don't know what it means anyway. It's always called Sturm und Drang, which is a pre-romantic movement. And that's when he wrote The Sorrows of Young Werther, who kills himself. And in copycat fashion, quite a lot of young men kill themselves all over Europe, apparently. A very dangerous novel. So don't go and read it. Um, uh, then around about the age of 25, uh, he, he changed completely. And he became much more the kind of this remarkable man who wrote this poetry, worked all his life on Faust, uh, and wrote a, num a number of plays, and yet at the same time lived a life completely in the world, in which he was an administrator, an excellent administrator in this duchy of Weimar. He was so capable, he was put in charge of many things, he was put in charge of the forestry. He was put in charge of the mines. He was put in charge of the market gardens. And he administered these, as well as other things too. He was very much a sort of uh, concerned with affairs of state. A small state, but nevertheless affairs of state. And this is how he, this is how he lived his life. And he, uh, he emphasised the importance of this. And... It says here in the, um, in the second, in his later life, Goethe surrounded him. Well, Goethe came to regard withdrawal into oneself, subjectivism, romanticism, as symptoms of the modern disease which poets ought to resist. Hence his intolerance of the romantics. In a remark to Eckerman, he said, All eras in a state of decline and dissolution are subjective. On the other hand, all progressive eras have an objective tendency. Our present time is retrograde, for it is subjective. We see this not merely in poetry, but also in painting and much besides. Every healthy effort, on the contrary, is directed from the inward to the outward world. Now, this is not what people expect. Go to the Romantic, going into himself and so he considered going into yourself as a sickness, a sign of sickness. And he himself lived his life in the world. And at the same time as doing this, he wrote this extraordinary poetry in these plays and so on and that. Which, and he saw it as necessary for him to live this active life of, as an administrator and so on and that, um, as part of who he was. Uh, now, of course, um, he, this is a great shock to people. Uh, they don't like it either, because they want Goethe to be a romantic and the founder of romanticism and so on. Of course, he knew all the romantics, a uh, huge number as well. They were, in, they were in Jena, 18 miles or so down the road from Weimar. But actually, Jena was part of Weimar, and Goethe was also involved with administering the university in Jena and was co-responsible with the Duke for making appointments at the university. He got a number of people appointed there, but terrific, he got Schelling appointed there, and, so, and it became an extraordinary centre for philosophical work. What's called German idealism really came out of that centre. But also the Romantics were living there at the same time, all the various people. I have a street map uh, somewhere at home, uh, which actually shows all the houses in uh, Jena at that time, or also yeah, that's right. And shows you where everyone was living. And you've got Schelling living there, just down the road you've got Hegel living, and so on. And it's amazing concentration of people for a short period of time. And, then he, and he, he was spent a lot of time there, of course. Um, but he, and he knew these people. And he, he, it's quite, uh, he had to be quite careful because he didn't alienate these people that he did not like romanticism because if he alienated these people he wouldn't have anyone to talk to uh, they were sort of his friends but he, and they always said that the, he, he was probably about ten years older than them and they say, he always said that there was a certain aloofness about Goethe and there was but the aloofness was also part of the fact that he didn't want to be drawn into something and possibly also slightly disapproved of something um, and so on. The one person exception is the philosopher Schelling. Uh, Goethe got him his job 
and uh, 1898. Schelling was a... 17. Huh? 1798. Thanks, 1798, yeah, thank you. Uh, he was a, 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 a comet, a, what do you call it now, a supernova, at the age of 19, 20. He, he, he was just an absolute supernova of philosophical work. Uh, it, it was a phenomenon of phenomenons. Um, and of course, later on it all went wrong, as it does, always. Uh, well, not always, but yes, it pretty much always does. Um, and uh, the, they said that the thing was, it's very interesting, that Goethe learnt from Schelling. Goethe had long conversations with Schelling, and they said, and Schelling was, of course, very young, it was in 1920. Go Goethe was twice, just, uh, 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 was over twice his age. And they said they noticed this extraordinary thing that Goethe saw himself as the pupil learning from the teacher Schelling. And so they said there was an exception. And because what he learnt from Schelling was what his own scientific work was doing. Because uh, Goethe always said that he himself had no, <coughs> no organ for philosophy. <coughs> Which means <coughs> he couldn't actually... <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> couldn't actually reflect on his own process of thinking in scientific work. He could do it, but he couldn't actually do the philosophy of his own science. So he couldn't actually see what it was he was doing. When he learnt what he was doing through his conversations with Schelling, then he became able to see it. And it's this dynamic thing we're talking about. Because uh, Schelling talked all the time about rising from nature as fact. T rising from nature as fact to nature as the activity itself in its acting. See, this is the kind of thing we're trying to do. We were doing this in phenomenology. Catching things that are going back upstream. Rising from nature as fact into nature as the activity itself in its acting. Actually, the living acting, which, which is nature. This is what Schelling was concerned with. So this is how Goethe himself came to understand <coughs> that his own approach was concerned with following the, following the coming into being of things rather than beginning with things in their finished state. It's from Schelling that he understood that that's what he, Goethe, was doing. It's, it's really quite interesting. And of course the other philosopher who was very interested in Goethe was Hegel. But um, Goethe couldn't understand the word Hegel said. He wasn't the only one. Um, but there are uh, passages in Hegel, which it seems to me quite clear, Hegel's notion of the concrete universal, um, which fits Goethe perfectly. And Goethe actually, Hegel said of Goethe, this is Hegel's comment was, what I do abstractly, he does concretely. Um, so there we have recognition again of this relationship and that's of course the whole point about Goethe <coughs> makes him in his scientific work understandable in a way in which these philosophers are not understandable because he actually did it concretely uh, they were doing it abstractly and that's hard to follow um, and so if you follow what Goethe did you can learn from that, this whole way of seeing, because it's concrete. Which is why working with Goethe is so, so easy. And it's, I mean, so much, I mean, I'm not interested in German idealism, but it's so much easier working with, with, with Goethe than it is doing phenomenology, um, which you have to go into the lived experience as living. There, you're doing, as it were, internally, well, actually, here you're doing all externally because it's external, it's concrete, it's easy. But I actually do find myself that the attempt to do the phenomenological work um, very, very attractive because ultimately I find for myself there's something un ultimately unsatisfying about just doing something in the external way. Um, but that's just me. So there's a bit, bit of background I wanted to fill in on on Goethe. The whole movement in, um, in uh, Jena exploded 
when Schelling was a meteor supernova and uh, they wanted to f fix him up with a woman and uh, this was what's her name oh, I've forgotten her name now she was the femme fatale there's always one in these movements um, and she was it I've forgotten her name Caroline well Caroline Burma I think anyway she had married one of the Schlegels. The Schlegels founded the, the journal, which is the journal in which romantic poetry and the theory of romantic poetry was discussed. And she had married one of the Schlegels, and I can't remember which Schlegel it was. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, uh, she, she was uh, older, that she began to get eyes for Schelling. And this uh, had this thing that, that these sort of almost bohemian types do, they, they discussed among themselves that actually Schelling would be more suitable for her than, than Schlegel. This is their mate Schlegel. Um, because um, Schlegel was a bit dull compared to Schelling. Caroline would do wonders for, uh, for Schelling and she needed so more of like that. And they persuaded Schelling to divorce Caroline and she married Schelling who was about 23. Well, she was an experienced woman, very, I've seen pictures of her. She has that, that um, voluptuousness, which, which some sort of German, Germanic women have. Um, and it, 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 to some people that's very attractive, of course. But she was a voluptuous woman um, and <laughs> older. <laughs> Poor Schelling, uh, it, was a, it was too much for him because basically... I mean, he hadn't really grown up. And I mean, um, so he found it a bit overbearing. And so what happened was that Caroline had a daughter, whose name I've forgotten, who was actually younger than Schelling, but much closer in age to him than, uh, than she was. And in those days, I think she was 14. But in those days, 14 was fine. It's not like now. 14 was fine. And so there was no problem with that. So you can see what's coming, can't you? And as a result of this, and then they went off to one of these places and uh, the daughter died. And the whole thing just blew up. And they blamed Schelling for this, that and the other and heavens knows what. And, and the whole of that movement in Jena split apart completely and sort of went away. It was all, and it all happened in the space of a few years. So the, the message of this is, you've got to watch out in any one of these movements to spot who the femme fatale is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the same thing happened in, didn't it, in Vienna with, with um, Marla's wife and so on and that. And the whole business was, uh, uh, you know. But we won't go into that, shall we? But uh, this, is, this is why this, this extraordinary concentration of people suddenly exploded and, and Schelling he sort of uh, he, he, he never was never the same man again and uh, he sort of he did work in universities he sort of disappeared he, he separated completely from Hegel and thought Hegel was wrong they'd work together as friends um, and he in, in the uh, 19, 1840s he got his chance to sit in the University of Berlin to say what was wrong with Hegel and they said it was a sort of failure because he didn't manage to convince anyone at all and he mumbled and so on and that really was the end of Schelling. So uh, watch out. If you're too bright, too young, um, you're, you're going to probably have problems. It's best to be not too bright when you're too young. That's it. Um, so that's, that's it. I don't have that problem. I never did. Okay, that's a bit of background which you might or might not be interested to know. Which, um, I'm going to go back now to Goethe's work on the plant, which is a kind of carrier wave for a way of thinking. And what I'm interested in is the way of thinking. Okay? So we, we had... Uh, where did we get to yesterday? We looked at the, this notion of metamorphosis yesterday. And uh, <coughs> I've just got to connect myself in here. And we came to the fact that there was some sense in which the different organs of the plant, some sense in which the different organs of the plant are one organ. 
one organ. He talked about this, didn't he? Uh, if I can remember what he said, it would be helpful. Um, oh, where are we? Let's find it. Come. Um, I bet Shelling didn't have this tool. I bet he couldn't. I bet he always remember what he said. Where is it then? Uh, Petals Raymond. Why can't I find what I'm looking for? Yes, we shall see. Uh, all the ma- ba- 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 which nature produces one part out of another ooh, ooh, and creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ. And again, the process by which one and the same organ presents itself to us in manifold forms has been called the metamorphosis of plant. So we've got this idea, (coughs) the modification (coughs) of one single organ. And the question now is, well, if the different organs of the plant are somehow one organ... What kind of one is this? What kind of one is it (coughs) that can present itself in manifold forms? And what's the relationship, in this case, between the one and the many forms in which it manifests? And this is something which I want to explore in detail because in doing so, we will come to understand something which is actually really quite fundamental um, it's, it's rather then I'll try to fit later on I'll try to fit it in to a historical pattern then you'll see how radical it is um, but often a lot of the work I have to do on this course is what I call remedial work um, filling in details about the cultural historical development of thinking in the West since the Renaissance and so on and that, so we can see just how radical what Goethe did is, was, will be, will be, yes. <laughs> <coughs> well, what kind of one is it? Well, in his own time, and in fact ever since, an answer has been given to this question. And this answer, many people think they know the answer to this question, what kind of one it is, they can tell you straight away. And this answer, in fact, is based on an assumption that is to be found nowhere in Goethe's work. And this is the assumption that what Goethe was searching for was what all the different plant organs have in common with one another. What's sometimes called finding their lowest common denominator. That which is the same in all of them. The common plan. Now, by trying to find what's the same in all of them, that means there's no difference between them. It's supposed Goethe that way discovered a unity in the diversity of the organs. The movement of thinking in this case, please notice, has the effect of excluding difference from unity. All differences are excluded if you're looking for what things have in common the respect of which they are the very same. And we can see this assumption very clearly in some of the statements I'm going to read that have been made about what Goethe was doing. These are drawn at random from books from the past. (coughs) And I don't give references to them because I'm actually going to say, well, this is rubbish. So uh, it's a long time ago since I took these from books. Anyways, all the authors are probably dead by now, so it won't matter. But one does have to be a little careful. Uh, Here's one. Goethe was transfixed by uniformities and commonalities in nature. Now, I haven't put the full thing in here because um, there are people I know who actually know the man who said this and they'll spot it. But that didn't work because by the time this book's finished everyone will have forgotten anyway. But what he actually said was, the full statement was, seemingly influenced by Plato's theory of universals. Goethe was transfixed by uniformities and commonalities in nature. Now, I don't think I've ever come across any statement that is as far away from Goethe as that is. I don't say I could get further from Goethe than that statement. 
First of all, he tells us what Plato was doing and gets it completely wrong. Uh, Plato, uh, you know, it's not, no, no, I'll leave that note. Um, yeah, well, it is wrong, by implication it's wrong. Uh, but anyway, let's leave the bit about poor old Plato. Um, Goethe was transfixed by uniformities and commonalities in nature. Um, well, you've already seen enough. Uh, the, whole, the man's own way of thinking is completely dynamic. It's, it's actually the very opposite of this. Yet clearly to the person who wrote that, it seemed evident that Goethe was looking for commonalities and uniformities. And again, another statement. He sought for the general plan common to all organs. How did he do that? Aha. Uh -huh. By trying to find, quote, the simplest form of plant organ from which the anatomist's mind had stripped all the specializations required by the organs of real living plants. In other words, you take the organs of plants and you remove all their differences until you're left with that which is the very same in all of them and you say this is what Goethe was looking for this is his one organ the lowest common denominator what is common to all organs statements such as these are typical but they clearly don't portray nature in the way that Goethe expressed to Schiller when he said he wanted to portray nature as working and alive, striving out of the whole into the parts. Uh, these seem to be, on the contrary, they portray nature as dead and finished, not as working and alive. Now when you read what Goethe says carefully, paying attention to the movement of thinking as we have been trying to do, you can easily see that he was doing something radically different from looking at what all the plant organs have in common. <coughs> we've, we've just seen nature creates the most varied forms by the modification of one single organ. The process by which one and the same organ manifests, uh, presents itself to us in manifold forms. Um, and in his letters and diary of his Italian journey, some more quotes, he says that he is becoming aware of the form with which again and again nature plays and in playing brings forth manifold life. And that, quote, the thought becomes more and more living that it may be possible out of one form to develop all plant forms. Notice he doesn't say the form with which nature plays again and again is nature's model or ground plan of the plant. Just as he doesn't say that he's trying to reduce all plant organs to one form. Now on another occasion he said, and this is one I want to latch on to, when referring to the organs of the plant, quote, it had occurred to me that in the organs of the no sorry it had occurred to me that in the organ of the plant which we ordinarily designate as leaf <coughs> the true proteus is hidden who <coughs> can conceal and reveal himself in all forms that's a remarkable statement because from that it's difficult not to get the idea that he's doing the very opposite of searching for what all the organs have in common. He's talking about the creation of difference within unity, not arriving at unity by the exclusion of difference. So the direction of his thinking is the other way around. <coughs> so I want to think about this Proteus statement because it's very, very interesting. You all know Proteus is this Greek god that can take any form. And of course, as we know, um, we don't, uh, just to make sure we don't upset anybody in today's multicultural society, uh, there is always an equivalent form of this throughout the entire world of this figure, okay? I'm uh, therefore not trying to 
uh, be whatever it is that was not supposed to be. I'm just referring to Proteus because Goethe referred to Proteus, and so that seems to me to be fair enough. That's what he would know about. Now, Proteus, what's important about Proteus is not the particular form in which Proteus appears, but the actual appearing itself. When Proteus appears in different forms, it's always the same Proteus. It's not another Proteus. So if Proteus appears in one form, I don't know, as a snake, or oh, in another form, I don't know, as... <coughs> suggest something. Hello, yes. <laughs> Then, <coughs> that's not two different Proteuses. It's one and the same Proteus manifesting differently in different circumstances. Now, you wouldn't, <coughs> you wouldn't try to understand Proteus by collecting together lots of different cases that, where Proteus had manifest or come to expression and say, let's have a look at these different instances and let's try to see what they've all got in common, shall we? Because if we can then do that, and we have to, if we can remove all the ways in which they're different, we might find some way in which they're common, and that'll be Proteus. Well, it's rubbish. You know it's rubbish immediately. Um, what you could do, therefore, in that sense, would be to produce uh, something like an average Proteus, which is one of the most ludicrous ideas I've ever heard of. So you wouldn't do that. Now, this, in dealing with the plant organ... Goethe is actually thinking in this protean way that there is one organ manifesting itself differently at different parts of the plant like Proteus and he actually says in this case he calls it leaf and in one, one, one notebook he writes hypothesis all is leaf and this completely confuses people Oh, right, I see. Goethe tried to reduce all the plant organs to a leaf. Oh, that's very interesting, isn't it? No, it's completely wrong. He didn't try to do that at all. Uh, <coughs> he just took it in the leaf. The true protest is hidden. But it's the same in the petal and the same in the stone. And therefore, you can actually see these, and it's often spoken in this way, you could say, well, the petal is a metamorphosis of the leaf. The stamen is a metamorphosis of the petal. You can say that, but the metamorphosis is actually at the uh, upstream stage in the embryonic germ cell. Not, it's not actually that the outer one transforms and so on. So clearly what he's talking about is something which is ever dynamic um, and not something which is kind of an average organ, just as you wouldn't have an average proteus. Oh, I've got to do some work in a minute. I've got to note here to myself, which says get up and, and, and imitate. Right. <coughs> in fact, if you could produce such an average organ, absolutely nothing could come from it. It's a dead end. It's a cul-de-sac. You can't actually produce an average organ by removing all differences from existing organs, and then get something from which difference itself can be produced. Because you've actually got that average organ by removing all differences. So it's a cul-de-sac. It's, 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 it's kind of dead end. So Goethe's not saying then, begin with the finished organs as they are on the plant. Try to abstract unity from them then you would only end up with what is common. Because for Goethe, the finished organs are already downstream. And to abstract from them only the unity of what they have in common would be to go further downstream. So what we've got is... Uh, in a way, what happens is Goethe goes in the opposite direction. Think of it like this. Uh, let's imagine what you can do with these plants. Well, a plant. <coughs> People do this. You can take a plant <coughs> and you could, because um, all the parts are external, you could take off the organs. 
and you could put them on a piece of paper. People do this kind of thing, or you could put them on a screen. I'm going to put them on a glass screen. So I put them on a glass screen, and I'm going to put the glass screen here. It is there's a glass screen. I'm standing here, and I'm looking at these organs of the plant. Okay, and I say, oh yes, that's very interesting. Look, I can see this now. If I uh, take that one there and I miss out that bit, and that one there, and I just miss out that bit, then they become the same. Oh, and if I now take that and this one here and I miss out that bit, then they become the same, and I produce what they have in common. Now I have found their unity. Now, think of it now. It's on the screen like that. And we're drawing the unity off like that. Now, that's not what Goethe does at all. Goethe isn't doing that. He's actually the other way around. I've done it. He's actually on the other side of the screen. And he's coming at it this way. And he's coming down to finish with the organs on the screen because he's bringing the organs back into the unity from which they originally went forth. So that's what he does. He's on this side bringing them back into the unity and then going down with them in their finished state. When you've got them in their finished state, twice in one day, then you can <laughs> abstract from them what they have in common. And that's the dynamic here. <laughs> Warming up now. <laughs> so what we've got is the finished organs if we imagine a kind of plane here here's the screen I was talking about and on them we've got this sort of finished organ so we'll have a leaf like that and we've got a petal I can't draw a petal but I'll try All right. petal. and then we've got a stamen thing and all, all that. There's, those are the finished organs. And this is the actual phenomenon with which you begin. Now what happens in the first instance is that people try to abstract what they have in common, the abstract unity, no, the downstream unity, no, Sorry, I forgot. Well, I have some very carefully chosen names for this. Yes, how about unity of the finished organs? Thank you. Uh, unity of the finished organs. Which is what they have in common. Okay, but what's actually happening is we're coming here from what is the dynamic unity of coming into being. Hyphenated, coming into being. And so we're coming down here like that. And that's where Goethe's coming from, not here. And this, of course, <coughs> here we've got, <coughs> this is coming downstream. And what happens here is we're going even further downstream. But really, what he's doing, he's going back upstream. That's the movement of his thinking. To try to go back upstream and then come downstream, not to start here and go even further downstream. <coughs> Yeah.
It's the same dynamic that we found in the act of distinguishing and in the act of seeing. <coughs> and we would find in the act of saying, if we studied that, <coughs> when we look at the <coughs> phenomenology of lived experience. It's the same dynamic. This is the extraordinary interesting thing about it. Here we're concerned with life, living organisms. There we were concerned with lived experience, which is life. And very often, see, you find that Hegel makes statements like, his concern is to understand life in terms of life itself. When he talks about life, he means the cultural historical life. He doesn't mean organic life. You see, and so the word life can have many different, different, different refer references. <coughs> but as soon as, as soon as it comes to life, we begin to get this kind of dynamic appearing. <coughs> so, doing this, we can begin to think in a protean way we come into the phenomenon from the unity but we've got to see what kind of unity that is well, of course here the dynamic unity of coming into being but my goodness that's merely the beginning because this unity will turn out to be very peculiar indeed not at all the sort of thing we expect they come from the unity into the phenomenon instead of going from the phenomenon to the unity to try to get that if you <coughs> if you think in a protein way that creates the most varied form is by the modification of one single organ you'll see you have to do that if you don't recognize the difference between these two movements of thinking then you fall into the error of trying to get to the milk by way of the cheese because what happens is but what people do, and I'll be coming back to this later, is they take this abstract unity here, this dead-end unity, and they say, oh, that's what Goethe believes is underlying everything. So they project it up there. That is, this is the cheese, all right. And they project it right back into the source. It's the end product. And they project it back to the source. And they say, this is the kind of fundamental unity he has in mind as if anything could come from that which had everything removed from it can you see the problem here this is, this is therefore turns everything <coughs> everything upside down um, and treat the unity you treat this unity of the dead end as if it were the unity of the living source as if it were the unity of the origin can you follow that it's, uh, it's a well uh, it's a pattern of thinking which we actually do all the time it's, uh, we always, always try to understand the coming into being in terms of the outcome. Time and again, when dealing with perception, when dealing with language, when dealing with distinction, you find you go wrong because you try to understand the happening of that in terms of the outcome and you back project it. And time, time is the same, we're not going into time, but we're going to get many illusions about, about things through, through, through the way we do this with time. <laughs> it, it always happens in this way. Um, and so here we have exactly the same thing. We tend, to, we tend to read back the result into the origin. And that way we get everything back to front. And so consequently people can very happily say <coughs> Goethe looked for what was fundamental. He looked for the ground plan, what was the ultimate basis of the plant. By abstracting all the differences and finding what, what the organs have in common. That's it. That's the ground plan. That's the ultimate. And uh, well, later I'll mention <coughs> this became very popular in 19th century Britain. Uh, this kind of approach and it was called um, archetypal anatomy uh, this is just before Darwin um, and it was practiced a great deal in Britain particularly by a man called Robert Owen 
And uh, in archetypal anatomy, you found the archetype. They call this the, they call this the we won't go into why the word archetype, but they call this, this ground plan, this what everything has in common, they called it the archetype. And uh, they actually then wanted to say, because they had transcendental pretensions, that this in fact is the thought of the organism in the mind of God from which God created the organism. And the reason for doing that is because they want it to be like physics. Because, I, I say I can't get into this remedial work, because if we do, we we'll spend a long time on this. But in the 17th century, uh, the, one of the great motivating forces for the work in mathematical physics was a religious dimension. Um, because it was believed that these mathematical relationships which were discovered, which later became law, later became called laws of nature, these were the thoughts of God. And therefore, when you were doing mathematical physics, uh, you were doing something which was a quasi-religious activity. And this is where it got its motivation from. It didn't have anything to do with what you people today think it did. You think it was all to do with control and and controlling nature and using nature that came later it was there, that came later at the beginning nobody was interested in, it hadn't occurred to anybody it occurred to Francis Bacon but it didn't occur to anybody else and Francis Bacon didn't come into his own until 200 years after his death Bacon's century was the 19th century that's when they rediscovered Bacon and we got then the Baconian sciences. In his own day, famous though he was, he had no impact whatsoever. Because it was this quasi-religious activity they saw there, which is what motivated people. Huge amount of stuff has been written on this, and most people, I, I mean, it's been written on this for decades and decades and decades. And most of the people I meet are completely unaware of it. And they come up with all this stuff about, oh yes, well they, these people, and they were mostly men, they're nasty. They just wanted to control nature. Nothing like it at all. They actually thought that they were discovering the mind of God, which they saw as a religious activity, which is understandable. <coughs> well, when we get to the 19th century, you see, physics envy goes back a long way everyone, wants to, everyone wanted to be like physics and uh, when we get to the 19th century with the emerging notion of a biological science and the term biology wasn't coined until the beginning of the 19th century but the various biological sciences were then lumped together under one name they wanted it to be a proper science and you became a proper science by being like physics. What did now we would say that, oh yes, they wanted to do measurements and so on. No. What did physics do? Physics discovered the fundamental laws which they could say were the thoughts of God in creating the world. So you became a fundamental science if you too could discover some other thoughts of God in creating the world. And so when they talked about this archetypal pattern that you could find and then you could project that into the say that's in the mind of God that's the pattern according to which God creates the organisms wow we've now got a real science like physics and of course it's got a religious dimension to it and that was very prevalent at the uh, at this early early Victorian period in this country and I mean we, we know the groups I mean I, I mustn't stop I spent, I spent years on the history of science um, I, I just found it so fascinating. I used to give lots of talks on the history of science. I've given public talks here on, on the real origin of Darwin and so on and that. <coughs> um, I don't do this now. I did that 20 odd years ago. But uh, if I get into it, it sort of opens up and I begin to remember things. So I've got to stop. Yes? Have you written books and articles on it? No, I haven't. No, but there are plenty of books that have been written on it. I always say, why should I write a book on this? when people don't read the books that have already been written. And it's true. Yeah? Did they realise they were inquiring into the way that God worked? No, that's what they thought. Oh, so they, they said were conscious it. of that. What? They were conscious of that. They were aware of that. Oh, no, they said, they said this is what we're doing. 
in the Scottish Yeah. Could you, is there a, a book or some books on the history of science that you could recommend to us that would be appropriate for the yeah. inquiry we're involved in? Yeah. Uh, for, what, for which inquiry? In, into the history of science. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, the book I always recommend, which deals with physics, and I recommend this very strongly, and it's by Margaret Wertheim, W-E-R-T-H-E-I-M, who's in Australia and worked as a journalist in New York. And it's called Pythagoras' Trousers. And the subtitle is God, Physics and the Gender Wars. Oh, yeah, she says, this is the book for me. Yeah. That's, that's famous, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a famous It's a very good book. And I do recommend that. When I read it, I was... Because I, I, knew, I, knew, I, knew, I knew a lot of stuff about this in science and about the real sources and how a lot of the stuff you get in the books is Mickey Mouse stuff and it's not the real thing. And when I saw her book, I, I nearly didn't bother with it because the subtitle put me off. I thought, oh... Bugger that, I'm not that thing, you know. but in fact, when I looked at it, in the bookshop, and I looked at it, I thought, oh wow, this woman's done her homework. She's got, she's got the right stuff in here. Because then I bought it and read it, and I thought, well, this is a wonderfully done book. And, I, and I've all, for years, I've always recommended it. And every, everyone should read that to get some kind of. Uh, uh, oh, you better. T I just swore. Um, I just swore. Um, you better turn it off. Uh, what did you say? Oh, I'm not repeating that. <laughs> the popularity of the tape suddenly went up. Um, now, uh, that doesn't deal with biology. Now, <coughs> unfortunately, the th notes I brought down. I, 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 I simply took out all the references, you know, there's another book over here, I have a lot of references and a lot of long footnotes and so on and that. Well, I've done the same in this, I'm going to change it, I'm going to take them out of the book a bit. But I, I just took, took those, left those all behind, so the details are, are, are at home. But uh, there is a book... It'll come to me later. But it's not so easy to read. It's not one that I would recommend generally. It's very detailed. God, my brain. It's gone. Now. I'll ring up my wife later. <coughs> tell her where it is on the bookshelf and she can go and see. Uh, I think... I can't remember. But it deals with transcendental anatomy in uh, in the medical schools in London and it's, it really does give a good picture of all of this but it's very detailed and it's very well written and there may be other things here. the biological books are harder to come by not so much has been done on them but you would, you would be okay with that because you're a doctor um, can't even can't even remember the man's name. Brian knew him. Oh dear, this is getting bad. Time for you to find somebody else to do this course. This is, <laughs> really, it's, going, it's not right. We shouldn't have. Uh, oh. yeah. Anyway, well, well, I'll have to look at that later. But the the big thing is uh, get on to um, Margaret Vertam's book. It's really good. Uh, right, OK, now we come to something pretty important, as if what I've just said wasn't important. Uh, and I wonder whether this might be a time for us to have coffee. Uh, I don't know how you feel about it, because I don't know what time I'm supposed to have coffee, but when we went down the other day, it was useless, because we waited till quarter past eleven so the others could have coffee. We just got in there and they all came in. This is because they have different clocks in Japan, you see. <coughs> so, what do you think? Yeah. Well, the point is, I'm going into a lot of stuff after this, um, and uh, it's going to build up in... Oh, God, yes. Why don't we have a cup of coffee now? Is everyone happy with that suggestion?